Good morning. Um, if you have your Bibles, open them up to Hebrews chapter 11, and then mark it. We're going to get there in a little bit. Um, Can anyone tell me offhand what Hebrews 11 is? Faith chapter. Is that? Faith chapter. The faith chapter, the hall of faith. And I have a, a number of things that I feel like God wants me to address through the course of this year. And I think the place we need to start is with faith. And so today we're going to talk about faith, what it is and what it ain't, okay? Um, every morning, Christy types up a note of encouragement and sends it to a lot of people, our children, adoptees, uh, those that just somehow or another have been engrafted into our family. And uh, I want to read to you uh, what she sent a couple of days ago. And that's, that's really the, the core of everything I want to get at today. Well, my Bible just does not want to stay open, so we'll have to turn back to that later. For you today, this is a quote, says, he took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it, it to him as righteousness. Now, I, I want to read this passage before I go a little bit further in, so you get an understanding of what's happening here. Um, this is out of Genesis chapter 15. So flip there with me if you would. It's right at the beginning. Complete opposite way of where we were a minute ago. <clears throat> now keeping in mind, chapter and verse was put in so that you and I could get to the same place. Okay? Because this, this chapter starts off at kind of an awkward spot. Starts off, after these things. Well, what things? Well, after what things? Well, that's in 14. And this is specifically um, after Abram had rescued Lot. And then he had made an offering to, to Melchizedek. So there was a, a, the, the kidnapping of, of Abram's nephew Lot. And then Abram and his men rescued them. And on their way back, they came across Melchizedek, who is the foreshadow of Jesus Christ. And he made an offering to him. Understanding his position, he, he, he gave a tithe of everything they had captured. And so after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram kind of odd that he would say, fear not, huh? I mean, he just conquered the Midianites and took back all that was his and more. And he has this vision. And the first thing the vision speaks to him is, don't be afraid. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. This is, this is 
big stuff. Okay? We, we miss a lot in our culture. We don't really understand how important, how vital an air was to the people at this time. This is what carried on their name and carried on their legacy. And Abram, who was called of God, out of a country and said, go to a place I will show you. And he packed up and went. And God took him and he set him up on a mountain. And he said, I want you to look as far as you can see. I'm going to give this land to you and to your descendants. But this hadn't happened yet. And so he's laying before God, how, how can this happen? What good is it if you bless me with all these things if there's no one for me to pass it on to? A member of my household, one of the probably what would be a servant in his household is going to be the recipient of everything that he had. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. God answers. God speaks to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. I want you to hold on to that for a minute. We know that Abram was advancing in years, so was his wife Sarah. They were beyond child-bearing years. Okay? Nothing had happened during the fruitful time. And now they're in the time of the fall, and there's, there's nothing, there's no chance physiologically, biologically, that anything can happen. And God's telling him, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look toward the heaven and number the stars if you were able to number them. You ever tried to count the stars? Montana is a great place to find out how futile that is. You, you start looking up and you start counting and, and then, well, if you're like me, that doesn't last very long. God knows them. He knows all of them. He knows the exact number and he knows their names. Then he said, so shall your offspring be. Abram, I want you to look beyond all that you can see. I am telling you something that in your mind is not logical. I am telling you something that to your senses is not possible. Look beyond. And he believed the Lord, he being <coughs> Abram. He believed the Lord. He trusted that what God said was going to happen would happen. And he counted it to him as righteousness. Okay, now, there's a lot of pronouns being thrown around here, so let's kind of get these in order. And he believed the Lord. Obviously, that's Abram. Abram believed God. And he, being God counted it to him, Abram, as righteousness. So I'm going to reread this, inserting the proper nouns. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted it to Abram as righteousness. It's important to grab that. Hold on to that. Okay? Hold on to that thought. I'm going to go back to uh, Christie's text earlier this week. She says, I've been pondering faith a lot lately and why God counts it as righteousness. And I'm realizing that it is a belief that results in action, even if that action is just rest and trust. And I haven't found anything yet in his word that indicates that faith doesn't completely contradict reason. It is completely independent from our five senses. In fact, it opposes them quite often and actively resists what makes sense to our minds. But God counts it as righteousness because it proves our trust in him beyond what is reasonable. That's why we're instructed to walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. But having our lives directed by faith is imperative if we are going to be 
what God has called us to be, and if we want to please Him, because without faith it is impossible to please God. And it's faith not only in His ability, but in the fact that He wants to do what He says He will do for you. How many of you, when you were a child, um, were told by your parents to do something and you said, why? And your parents in their infinite wisdom said, because I said so. And you thought, I will never say that to my child. And have. You become a parent and your child says, why? Because God has instilled that in them to teach us patience. <laughs> and you said, because I said so. You understand that you are requiring of your child the same thing that God is requiring of you. You are requiring your child to put their faith in you blindly, without reason. It makes perfect sense. I should be allowed to go play the ball in the street. It's like dodgeball, only worse. <laughs> I should be able to put that thing in my mouth. The dog does. <laughs> Everything I put in that bowl disappears. Watch, flush. <laughs> my truck got stuck. <laughs> Don't do that. Why? <laughs> because I said so. Christy, take care of your child. <laughs> See, there's a weird thing that happens in life. As children, we are born ignorant of a lot of things. And we learn typically by making mistakes by doing things wrong. And if our parents were not good parents, we'd learn a lot more things by doing things wrong. But then as we grow up, we start to transition from a helpless child that is needing desperately parents to guide them and guard them. And we start to kind of change in our position with our parents. And we go through the phase where our parents are absolute idiots and don't know anything. I remember very clearly being at that stage. I, I thought, I, I'm amazed my parents lived this long. <laughs> and then we get to the point where, huh, maybe they did know a thing or two. And then after a while we realize, my parents were geniuses. They had to deal with me. <laughs> and they didn't kill me. And they didn't go to jail. But then there's this, this dynamic in the relationship where all of a sudden we become peers. And all of a sudden I can talk with my parents on a peer level. Because I now have children that are just like me. And I can relate to my parents now. And I can understand why my dad had a bald spot. Because you just go, why? <laughs> And we want to take that same progression and that same growth and we want to try to apply it to our Heavenly Father. And it doesn't work. Okay? Because see, God never sees us as anything other than what we are and what we are, our children. Okay? In comparison to God, we will never become the adults. We are his children. We 
We get to this point in our walks where we feel like we deserve to know the answers. And we stand before God and we say, God, why is this this way? Why do I need to do this? Or why should I not do this? And God says, because I said so. And we go, I want to know. I'm an adult. I deserve to know. Tell me. Now, I don't know what kind of family you guys grew up in. In my family, you did that once. <laughs> and you never did it again. Because typically, if my father lowered the newspaper and looked at you over the top, it was over. <laughs> okay? You know, if he folded it and set it to the side, you better run. But if he looked over the top of it and all you saw was this, that was bad news. Uh, my father had a very short way with attitude. Our Heavenly Father delights in our faith and trust in Him. And there are certain things that our tiny brains will never, ever, ever be able to figure out. See, that's the, the, the difference between Him and us. He's God, we're not. He has always been and will always be God, we have never been, nor will we ever be, God. Okay? You understand that? This life is not about becoming equal to God. That's, that's not the object here. It's to become like Him. Okay? To become mini versions of Him. That the world would be able to see Him through us. At best, we should be glasses. Okay, that we can insert in front of people's eyes so they can go, wow, I never saw it that way before. I remember my brother-in-law had, had very, very poor eyesight, but it was not known for a long time. And he was actually married to my sister before he went to an eye doctor. And the eye doctor was like, wow, man, you need glasses. You need, like... Coke bottle glasses. And I used to always razz him because he loves sports. And I, man, when we play pig or horse, I could beat him every time. And I stink at basketball. And he could do the layups, he could do the dunks, he could do all that. But when he was shooting, well, come to find out, he couldn't see the basket. And I remember my sister telling me, it was amazing, on their way home from getting the glasses, he put the glasses on and he's driving around and he looks over and he goes, I had no idea that you could see the leaves on trees. Seriously? Because when you, you know, when you're that close to a tree, you can pull it down and look at it, but when you step away from a tree, it's just a mass. And he had no idea you could see the individual leaves on a tree. And how often are we like that? We're limited by our own vision. See, faith is required unto salvation. And faith is blind and what oftentimes seems stupid trust. Um, you, have you guys ever seen the trust fall? Do not do it with any of my children. <laughs> unless you're catching them. Uh, and don't do it with Josh either. Because I've heard, I've seen more failures with the trust fall in, in that family group than anyone. Because Benjamin assumed that Josh knew what a trust fall was. And he said, trust fall, and fell. And Josh went, what? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we, I've seen trust falls where two of my boys will be ready to catch them. And then they'll say something and they'll look. <laughs> <laughs> so, but trust fall is just a small step, a small thing compared. Does everybody know what trust fall is? No. Okay, you don't know what a trust fall is? I need a volunteer. <laughs> Bench. <laughs> <laughs> Come on.
Come help me. <coughs> Sierra, you're going to be the victim. I mean, the example. Come here, Sierra. Stand up there. Face that way. Can you assess me? No. <laughs> That's why I'm here. All right. When I say now, you close your eyes. You just close your eyes. It's better that way. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> when I say now, you just fall backwards. Don't step, don't cheat, just fall. Okay? Okay? Mm -hmm. Now. <laughs> she trusts us. <laughs> That's a trust fall. And it's a scary thing when you don't know if you can trust the people that are behind you. Um, when we come to God, it's got to be with faith. You cannot approach God any other way, okay? You can't come before him and negotiate. It's all or nothing. It's actually all and nothing. Because see, in order to come to God, first you have to believe, well, you know what, let's, let's just go right there. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Now this week, I want you guys to read this entire chapter. And after you've read the entire chapter, I want you to go back and look at the stories that are being told here. Okay, so look up each story and see what actually transpired there. I'm only going to read a few verses. I'm going to kind of pick through as we go down. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. <clears throat> what does that mean? I mean, I, I know a lot of people can quote this verse, but can people tell me what this verse means? See, we talk about the great hope that we have, being Christians. But it's, it's a hope that is not as that something might be. It's a hope in something that will be, and we're just waiting for it to happen. Okay? It's like the little child that says, I hope Christmas comes. Well, they know Christmas is going to come. There's no doubt that Christmas is going to come. As Christians, our hope is not in something that we think might be, but in something that God has said will be. But it's something we don't necessarily see. Okay? The assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Does anybody have a, a version that says something different, phrases that a little bit differently? Confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And assurance about what we do not see, okay. Um, anyone else? Sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Certain of what we do not see. I heard somebody over here start to... Faith means being sure of things we hope for and knowing that something is real even if we do not see it. Okay. You're starting to get the picture here? See, let's read a little bit further down. For by it, by what? By faith, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. 
For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to read verse 6 again. This is a verse that you need to knit into the very fiber of your brain. Okay? And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. In this life, in this culture, in this society, we commend a lot of things. We find a lot of things that please us. Um, there are books and books and books written. Um, the the five, long, lo, five love languages, not long languages. <laughs> five love languages um, is a fantastic resource for how to communicate love to people around you. you. You identify what speaks love to them. And we determined uh, very early on in our marriage, there are five love languages, and Christie's two highest are my two lowest. And my two highest are her two lowest. And knowing that has enabled us to begin to speak love to each other in a way that we can receive. For example, Christie's one of her love languages is acts of service. Um, she's always doing stuff for people. And my children take advantage of it horribly. Mackenzie. <laughs> yes, turn red. It's appropriate. One of the things that I do to speak love to my wife is she works nights and I stay awake to help her stay awake and I make her coffee or bring her tea. I do the dishes. I do dishes, yes, dishpan hands. Um, because one of the things that really bothers Christy is going to bed knowing that the house is cluttered. So before I go to bed, I straighten up. I make sure the dishes are in the dishwasher or washed and dried and, and put away. I make sure all the toys are picked up. Yes, I have toys. No, it's my grandchildren. I, I make sure the house is straightened up so when she goes to bed, she doesn't have to think about those things. So when she gets up in the morning, she doesn't have to work. She doesn't have to go clean up the mess from last night. Now, that takes me on an average about six or seven minutes a night. Not a big deal. But it speaks love to her huge. I am a physical touch person. If you've been around me for very long, you know I touch people. <coughs> uh, I come from a very physical touch family. Sometimes it was good, sometimes it was not so much. <laughs> My poor mother-in-law, Christie's family is very German. And they, you know, do things like walk down the hall and turn sideways so they don't touch each other. <laughs> My family, if you walk down the hall, you lower your shoulder and try and run into them. <laughs> and her poor mother. You know, here I come into this family that is very German and very reserved, very stoic. And here I am. <laughs> Help me! And her mother would just go. <laughs> 28 years later, her mom comes in the door and she's like this. <laughs> and some of my children go. <laughs> We speak love in different ways, okay? And, and one of the things that pleases us is when people know how to speak to us in a way that we can receive, okay? Uh, a, another classification, we learned this in the Dave Ramsey class, is the free spirits and the nerds. I'm a nerd. Christy's a free spirit. And very rarely do the two ever meet. I tend to stand with both of my feet planted, not moving very much, and she's everywhere. And she, she loves spontaneity. I plan my spontaneity. <laughs> 
<laughs> Laugh all you will, but if I don't tell her, she doesn't know it, and to her it's spontaneous. Yeah. Okay? So, it works. But see, what pleases God, what touches his heart, isn't our work. Isn't even our attitude. It isn't how many people we've brought to the Lord. It isn't how many times we preach the word. It isn't how we voted. What pleases the Lord is that we trust. <coughs> that we trust that when he says he will accomplish something, he will accomplish it. When he says something is so, it's so. I'm, I'm, I'm going to share with you how horrible of an example I am at this because when my kids were young, especially the three older boys, I would make stuff up. I never read a book through one. Every night it was a different story even though it was the same book. I would look at a picture and just make up a story because the stories were boring. They wanted the same books every night. My kids would ask questions. And Christy would say, I don't know, ask your father. And I'd make up a story right on the spot. And I had lots of stories. One of these days, when it's not in front of the church, ask me how the Rocky Mountains came to be. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. It has to do with buffalo wings. <laughs> but my kids got to a point where they would go, Mom, is that true? <laughs> to everything I said. <laughs> See, that's, that's a horrible example because God is not wanting us to be like that. He wants us to go, okay, well, God said it. You, know, you remember the old saying, God said it, I believe it. That settles it. That settles it. Okay? Because there are things in this life that we will never, ever comprehend. Okay? Honestly, I don't understand why God chose Israel. I mean, I understand he, he called Abram and he said, from you I will make a nation of people of my very own. I understand that. But I go, why Abram? Why not Lot? Why not Billy Bob? Why not, you know? I mean, why Abram? And why that people? Especially when you look through the history of that people and how stiff-necked and stubborn they are. It's an amazing thing. When we were over there, I was floored because here are the people of God and they're talking about all these incredible things that they come back to Israel, the land, and now the land is flourishing. And what was desert for hundreds of years is now bearing fruit and, and just about any kind of any produce that they plant there grows. And they think it's because of them. Because we're a great people. Because we're smart. Because we can do things. No. Because you're blessed. Because your God can do things. The God who chose you that you are refusing to acknowledge. See, God hasn't explained to me why that people. He hasn't explained to me why that place. Why that place? I mean, we drove from the, the sea, the Mediterranean Sea. We went up to the Sea of Galilee and all the way down to the Dead Sea and, and places in between. Well, as far as I can tell, Montana, especially the Bitterroots, a whole lot prettier than that place. We've got a lot of mountains here that they could level off and put a temple. But God chose that place. He even marked it with his name. Geographically, he marked it with his name. He hasn't explained to me why. You know what I hear when I ask? 
because I said so. I don't need to know. I don't, I don't have to know. It isn't going to change anything one way or the other. Faith is the assurance of things that is hoped for. The assurance of. Not that it might be, but it will be. The conviction of things you can't see. Are you absolutely convicted? Are you unshakable in your belief that God exists? Let me rephrase that question. Are you absolutely unshakable in your belief that God exists? Yep. Yes. That was so pathetic and lame. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Because see, if you're kind of like, yeah, except for that one thing. God wants us to first believe that he exists. Paul writes in Romans, that creation itself testifies to him. Look at the way things are all around us. So first, we understand, we believe emphatically, unshakably, that he exists. Second, that he rewards those who seek him. Are you absolutely convinced that God rewards everyone who seeks him? Absolutely. Everyone. That includes me. That includes you. That includes Al-Qaeda. ISIS, Boko Haram, Chinese communists, if they seek him, he will reward them. Because folks, they're in the same pit that he drew us out of. Their portion of the pit may look a little different, but it was the same pit altogether. I've got my rubber group bracelet, bandlet, whatever. I don't even know what these things are called. And every day, Christy and I remember to pray for the persecuted church. And, and I have to tell you, some days, especially after I read something on the news, some atrocity that has been um, perpetrated against my brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, a couple days ago, I read uh, between 1 and 1.4 million the number was revised yesterday to 1 to 1.8 million Christians have been murdered or displaced in northern Iraq and Syria in the last two years. That's more than the entire state of Montana. And I hear about the things that they're doing. Uh, they've come up with a new way to persecute the Christians. They put them in a casket, soak it in oil, and light them on fire. Yeah. And I struggle on days when I read those things with praying that God would save those people because part of me wants God to send them all to hell and let them burn. Mm -hmm. And yet it was for them that he came in the form and fashion of man and went to the cross. Not just me, not just you, but for them. Okay. He looked at the full measure of what separated man from him and knew that there was a way to restore man, a way needed to be made so that man could come back before God in a right relationship. It wasn't just for those that kind of sinned. It wasn't just for those that, you know, a little bit of sin. You know, I did a little of this, I did a little of that. I may have done a whole lot of that, but I never killed a Christian. Okay, that, that didn't enter into his thinking. He took the entire measure of sin, every ounce of it, 
<coughs> he counted the cost, he saw what it would cost, and he found it worth the price. Because it doesn't say, 2 Corinthians 5, that he came for just these sins. It says that he took all sins. He became sin who knew no sin. We rejoice for Peter and Andrew, James and John, the disciples that followed Jesus. But how much more rejoicing in heaven do you suppose there was when Paul, who persecuted the church and killed the followers of Christ, had his eyes open? Literally, the scales fell off of his eyes. And he turned 180 degrees, and he didn't just, you know, Oh, I'm going this way, and I, I guess I'll go this way now. And he came to a dead stop, 180 degrees, and he flew the other direction. He ran as hard as he could, over and over and over again. He talks about it being a race, a contest, a wrestling match. And he said, I'm putting my eyes on the prize, and I'm not giving up till I get there. I'm running this race as though I want to win it. Not just finish, but to win. <coughs> Faith is not figurable. You can't figure it out. I don't care how smart you are. There are a lot of you in here that are much smarter than I am. You will never be able to figure out God. Okay? Very simple reason. He's infinite. You're finite. Okay? That, that means he goes on and on and on forever. He knows everything that ever was, ever is, and ever will be all the time. He knows it. I don't even know the rules to cribbage. <laughs> the more I come to know, the more I know I don't know very much. You cannot figure it out. Your intellect will fail you every time. And, and I, I want to tell you, your intellect will trip you up often. It will get you in trouble because for a lot of years I tried to figure it out. I wanted to know the where's and the why for's. And it frustrated me because I couldn't figure it out. I would think I got a handle on it and got to just laugh. Faith is not dependent on your logic. Faith flies in the face of your senses. God, I'm, I'm old and my wife is old and we're past childbearing years. How are we going to be able to do this? Because I said so. Good enough for me. Noah, I want you to build an ark. Ark. What's an ark? Bill Cosby does an incredible go around with that. He, he gave questions that I'd never even thought of. I know what an ark is. I've been learning about art since I was four years old. I want you to build a boat right here. Well, okay, God, but why? Well, because I'm going to flood the earth. Now think about this for a moment. At that point in time, Scripture tells us that it had never rained. That the earth was watered with dew every morning. And God's going to flood the earth? That's a lot of dew. <laughs> and Noah, not just Noah, I mean, you've you got to wonder about the faith that his kids had in him. 
Because Noah says, all right, kids, we're going to build an ark. And they're like, well, it's an ark. <laughs> we're going to build a boat. Great. Dad, we don't live by any body of water. Oh, God's bringing the water. Dad, why are we building an ark? Because I said so. <laughs> it flew in the face of their senses, their logic, and their intellect. And it saved their lives. Not only their lives, but the lives of their wives. You gotta wonder what David thought as he was hiding in the wilderness, hiding in a cave. When years before Samuel had said, God has anointed you and called you to be the next king of Israel. Well, I don't know, man. The last time I saw the king, he tried to stick me to the wall with a spear. Things ain't looking so good, God. It flew in the face of logic, especially when the king is laying right in front of him and all he's got to do is shove that spear right through his heart. Hey, I'm king. No, that's not how God said it was going to be. You got to wonder about the disciples. Jesus said, hey, come and follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. I, personally, I prefer fish. You can eat them. And they put everything down, and they went, and they followed it. <coughs> it didn't make sense. Hey, Peter, go down there and grab a fish out of the lake. Inside, you're going to find a coin that will pay for my temple tax and yours as well. <coughs> I got, I got the tune to Mayberry RFD running through my head, and, you know, walking with the fishing pole. And he goes down and he gets him a fish, and sure enough, there it is. Folks, the, the, the crux of what I want you to understand today, what I want you to walk away from here today, is God is requiring of you blind trust. Absolute trust. Being willing to lay aside your own understanding and accept what he says is so. Even if it flies in the face of what logic tells you. Even if your five senses can't apprehend what is going to happen. There's no way this can happen. There, there's no way that this is going to work. Now, one of the things that you will see over and over and over and over again, when God requires someone to trust, what does he do? That verse tells us. He rewards them. Every time God required someone to trust in him, he gave the answer. Abram, I want you to pack up. I want you to go. All right, God, where are we going? Oh, to a place I'll show you. Oh, that would stress me out. <laughs> that would stress me out. Man, when, when we take trips, I've got two or three routes, just in case one of them doesn't work. I know where I'm going. I'm knowing how I'm getting there. God says, pack up and go. Okay, where are we going? Well, I'll show you. It didn't make sense. It doesn't have to make sense, because in your mind... What makes sense is exactly the wrong thing. Okay? As people, as Christians, if you are going under the name of Christ, you are calling yourself a Christian, you, by definition, have got to be a person of faith. Okay, now I'm going to take just a little segue, just for a minute. Faith does not manipulate God. Okay? You can't just determine that you're going to have faith for something because you want it and God's going to have to give it to you because you have faith. God's not a little genie in a bottle. He's not a slave subject to your will. So you can't go, well God, I want this and expect that this is exactly what he's going to give you. I used to say that God will only give you three answers. Yes, no, or not yet. I don't think that anymore. 
I think he says, yes, but the timing's up to him. Or, I've got something better for you. Now, let's get out of our American mindset. <coughs> something better doesn't necessarily, you need a car and he's going to give you a Rolls. Okay? Something better might be that he gives you a carpool. And you get an opportunity to ride back and forth to Missoula every day with somebody that needs God. Something better might be that that person you're praying for to get well goes home. That's the best thing we can get, going home. Amen. That's why my concern, when anybody says somebody is, is sick, <coughs> very concerned about them, first, where are they at in eternity? That's, that's the critical issue right there. Not give them longer life here, but where are they going when this life is over? That's what's important. Then, okay, if we know that their eternity is secure and they're going there, hey God, if you want to leave them here longer, that would be a blessing to us. We sure would love to have them. But really, are we praying the best thing for them? Really? Isn't that kind of selfish prayer? It defies your intellect. It defies your logic. It defies your senses. And quite honestly, in America, we have become so dependent on the almighty dollar to answer our needs that we're people of very, very weak faith. Very weak faith. If God doesn't answer us with a miraculous answer, we'll just go buy it. We'll look for a way to work around. God doesn't need any work. When God tells you something, when God says that he has something he wants you to do or is going to do to you, through you, or for you, trust that he will do it. When God tells you to do something that seems absolutely ridiculous, trust him. Trust him. You've already said that you believe he exists. Do you really believe that he rewards you for seeking after him? I want to be like these men in Hebrews 11. I want to have faith such as these. And I want to read you something. I'm going to drop down. I'm just going to wrap this up really quickly here. I'm going to start in 32, and I'm just going to read down for a little bit. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection, all that sounds great, doesn't it? Just keep reading. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered, suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in the skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. See, this isn't just the writer of Hebrews commending these men. This is God commending them to us. This was inspired of God's Spirit to be written down for us to receive. 
God himself is commending these people. I want to be like them. I want to be somebody that God would commend. I, I, don't, I don't like struggles. I don't like trials. I, I often stumble. Thank you, God, that you give retests. God teaches to mastery. He lets you take the test over and over and over again until you get it right. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, faith. Being assured of what you hope for and being convicted of what you can't see. Let's start there for this year. We're going to start as a people of faith. Remove all the clutter, all the religiosity that we've surrounded about this. Let's just start afresh right here as people of faith. Amen? Amen. Father, we bless you. I thank you, God, that you have given us your word, your truth, that, Father, your light shines on us, that you show us the way in which we should walk, that your spirit teaches us Father, you always give opportunity for us to grow our faith. You are always proving yourself faithful, trustworthy. I ask, Lord God, that you would help us to live as a people of faith. Absolute certainty, absolute trust, that what you have said you will do, you will do. Who you have said you are, you are. We bless you, Father, and we thank you. In Jesus' name.